Okay, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, ladies and gentlemen, got something I want to show y'all. Don't want to do no, um, no stupid uh, commercials. So what I want to do, because this is Microsoft Edge, this is not the video that I want to reference you to. I believe this is the video right here. Uh, nope, this is, I need the one that's Assyrian. So hold on, the Empire of Iron. That's the total title. Yeah, this is the Assyrians, the Empire of Iron. Uh, I, I, Iron. Oh, three hours. There you go. That's what it's supposed to be. All right, hold on now, Assyria. Hold on. We're going to get to you in a second. Ladies and gentlemen, a lot of people have been doing their own research, and they've been watching videos like this. Now, this video is accurate for the most part, but then... It mixes all kind of dates on purpose because it wants to take away from the credit that it gives. So let me show you how it does that. We're gonna go to an, an hour and 20 minutes. Yes, I've watched this for the last hour or two hours. Hour and 20 minutes. So now this is gonna talk about Assyria and they were having some problems with some of their uh, conquered people. You know, the lands they conquered, the people were rebelling and they had to crush the rebellion. And then they bring up that perhaps Hezekiah of Jerusalem, that's the reason why he rebelled is because he saw all the other nations rebelling. Now, even the Bible doesn't tell us why Hezekiah refused to pay because as a nation, they had agreed to pay. But all of a sudden, Hezekiah said, I ain't paying that fool no more. And the king of Assyria at this time was King Sennacherib. Now, if you guys have never heard of Sennacherib, Sennacherib was the last great king of Assyria. If you've never heard of Assyria, Assyria's capital was Nineveh. Now, in this story right here, uh, <laughs> which is stupid, they're saying Assyria was built up underneath Sennacherib. No, the Assyrian Empire existed prior to Sennacherib, okay? I don't know. Look, y'all saw me. I didn't touch anything. I was sitting up here waiting to get started, and this thing just bounced all the way back. I don't know. My, my hands are a little wet because I'm giving myself a pedicure. You got some pets and you're carrying them? That's right. Um, no, I'm really, literally taking care of my feet. Because as D.C. Curry says, I will sit up here and take care of you for the rest of your life. I will go to battle for you. Somebody say something bad about you, I'll kill him. But I ain't sucking your toes. I don't care what you say, what you do. You can mix them with chicken if you want to. I still ain't sucking your toes. You can sit up there and add gold to it. I ain't sucking your toes. And then he goes on and on, and then he finally stops at, but if you add barbecue sauce, now add some A lot of people. Okay, then we, we can probably work something out. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I don't want nobody sucking on my toes. I don't even know where people got that stupid idea from. That's a fetish. I ain't got no fetishes. I don't know where people get them fetishes from in the first place. You need to let that go, mother. I'm sorry. I apologize. Ladies and gentlemen, some of you who are married, you allow each other to do things that, man, that's between y'all. And send me back the seal Y'all go ahead and y'all knock yourselves out. Okay? But these you cylinders know what I don't were hear? expensive. I don't hear the talk And they signified so their holder the was an up. important person let's, let's of high class. Let's find out what's class. going on with the volume, y'all. Y'all, this is people Microsoft Edge. I'm on a different side one. of my computer. And to sign okay, a contract, I have two sides they would simply press their fingernails into the oh, clay. I don't want to go there. Meaning that the marks of these I ancient people's speaker. hands are still left I have two sides on to my some computer, of these documents. Let's see. I'm going to turn up the volume here. And let's do the sound. The people who I live these this. countless lives. Okay, I want to pause that because, well, yeah, I can let that in go. The streets we got of time. The great Assyrian but cities what I want to do is we're probably is largely unaware of what sound. was going on. In the vast grand palaces that loomed over so their cities, 
We're gonna set this as default. They would have likely followed there the comings go. and goings of kings All right. with some interest. Ladies the way we might pay attention Get that to out here. I don't need no advertising. Gossip. But to them, the inner workings of the royal palace would have been as inaccessible now he's talking about and the people of, as the center uh, of the earth. Assyria. How they but wouldn't have known what was going in on inside the chambers. palace. Would have However, an enormous we gonna skip on this because we're gonna go here. No, we're gonna go here. Right about here is where we're gonna start talking about how they suddenly stopped paying tribute to the empire. Well, they're claiming that Nebuchadnezzar, it's a possibility he did that because everybody else wasn't paying tribute and that Assyria wouldn't be able to focus their attention on, I said Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Hezekiah. Coast. That Assyria wouldn't be able to focus their attention their on Hezekiah. The empire. Now pay attention the to what Egyptians, he says. The Egyptians, always happy to throw sand in the eyes of the Assyrians, moved to back the rebels' fight for independence. Now, what you don't know, the reason why Egypt is so important in his story, because he's not given a story from the biblical account. He's not giving biblical history. He's giving that history through archaeological digs and all of that. The reason why Egypt is so important in this and how they were interfering is because the Israelites were warned, do not go back by the way of Egypt. They were warned, do not go. Oh, I almost spilled all my water, y'all. I almost spilled all my water because I'm trying to take my feet out of the water and let them dry. But I just did it wrong, y'all. I did it wrong. I don't know what I was thinking. So, uh, oh, I'm sorry. In order to do your feet properly, ladies and gentlemen, most people don't know, but the people who have done it right, they know that you have to let them soak. You can't just start doing this to your feet and that to your feet. They got to soak. Um, don't worry about it. Don't, I don't need your advice. Well, why are you giving your advice? Because I can, mother. Then I can give you my advice. Go right ahead and see what happens. No, go right ahead. Email me your advice and see what happens. See how that'll be the last time you email me some advice. Okay? That's how that works. Well, why do we get the, you get the, and, and, and because that can, mother. Then if you can do it, I can do it. You already talked about equal protection. Oh yeah, you're gonna be protected, all right? Be protected against ever emailing me ever again? Go ahead. Defy me, mother. Well, fine. I ain't gotta write you anyway, so I'm gonna email you. I'm gonna do it whatever I want. Oh, you go right ahead. You go right ahead. Live life dangerously. Yeah, you, you like that. So you go right on ahead, stupid mother. What who you call it? Go ahead and say something again. I apologize, ladies and gentlemen. They, they are back from vacation. They, they went away on that thanks, thanks for, for giving Indian day. And, oh, well, y'all know what Thanksgiving is all about. It, it's thanks Indian given. That's the that's the Indian given day. That's what the United States did, ain't it? The Indians were so nice to them, gave them so much, and the United States said thank you, and took everything away without asking. Thanks for Indian given day. That that that's what it was. And, and I'm surprised we don't still give out small pox. Okay. The blankets to keep people warm. It was winter time, y'all. It was winter time, so they gave them smallpox blankets to keep the people warm. That was so kind of the United States. Man, don't y'all don't y'all dare say nothing bad about Miss Jenkins. The United States, that's what the United States do. Now we're gonna let this play for a second, okay? And the young Sennacherib quickly found himself plunged into a fight for the Empire's survival. The young king quickly gathered the full force of the imperial army and dealt with the rebel kings in the usual Assyrian fashion. What they don't tell you is that he can call Sennacherib the young king because Sennacherib was young, relatively. He and his father were reigning together at the beginning of his reign. So it was two kings at once, the son and the father. That happened a lot in ancient times. However, ladies and gentlemen, at this point, Sennacherib is by himself. And Sennacherib's got a lot of power because they are an empire. They are ruling the world. There is no competition. 
There is no competition. I don't care what nation you claim had competition with Assyria. Assyria had no competition. There was no nation, not in China, not in India. Nobody was messing with Assyria. Why? Because Assyria was ruthless. If you think it was an NWA and a record label, no, Assyria was ruthless. Skinning people alive, burning people in oil, tearing people's lips off. This was Assyria. But hold on, let, let me let him tell you a little bit. Taking them on, one by one. He first marched east and crushed the peoples of the Iranian lowlands. Then he marched north and around the fertile crescent to the Mediterranean coast and reconquered the rebellious kingdoms there, as he recalls in the following inscription. With the weapons of the god Asher, my lord, and my fierce battle array, I turned them back and made them retreat. I quickly slaughtered and defeated the king of the land of Elam, together with his magnates who wore gold jewelry like fattened bulls restrained with chains. I slit their throats like sheep and cut off their precious lives like thread. Like a flood after a rainstorm, I made their blood flow over the broad earth. The swift horses, harnessed to my chariot, pulled into floods of their blood. The wheels of my war chariot, which lays criminals and villains low, were bathed in blood and gore. I filled the plain with the corpses of their warriors like grass. I cut off their lips, I cut off their hands, like the stems of cucumbers in season. One of these campaigns is remarkable because we have accounts of it written by both the winners and the losers in a level of detail. Now, ladies and gentlemen, do you hear? See, what most people don't know in ancient times, you couldn't count on them to be accurate with their history telling because usually they exaggerated. Usually they didn't tell the good and the bad. They only told the side that made them look good. And so that's why he says, unlike times in the past, here is they have details from both the winners and the losers of the event. The winners and the losers. Highly unusual, ladies and gentlemen, in history for you to get details about the winners and the losers of a particular battle. Go back and look. We'll do all the research you want to do. Everyone who ever fought in a war and ever told the story always told the best in favor of themselves. You're going to see that that's being done a lot in this documentary. It's a three hour long documentary, y'all. Well, let me explain something. What he's about to do, the group or the publication or the information that tells both sides of the story, he's about to tell of Hezekiah and the Jews, but he's not going to, uh, of course, they're going to read from the Jewish Bible, and they're going to translate it into English. It's not going to be as precise as it should be, but it will be enough for people to get the idea. You know what I'm saying, Byrne? So, I'm going to let y'all get the idea, because there's a reason why I'm doing this. So, y'all hold on. Most unprecedented anywhere else in the 8th century BC. This is because its records have survived not just in the chronicles of Assyria, but also in the Bible. This was Sennacherib's campaign against the kingdom of Judah. Now, hold on. Don't think that this idiot likes the Bible. He actually does everything in his power not to talk about Scripture. This is the only time that he actually goes into detail about Scripture, when he's talking about Jerusalem and Lachesh. And... Sennacherib and Hezekiah. Other than that, he doesn't talk about how when they took Lachesh, they took the people of Jerusalem and they settled them. Well, they didn't, it wasn't so much Jerusalem, it was Samaria. And they settled them. That's where Ahab's kingdom was, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, they settled them in Assyria. And then they took Assyrians and they brought them to Samaria. And they had been intertwined ever since that day. That's where it started, with Sennacherib. The Bible gives you that information, but if you watch this particular video, you'll see that that was the tradition of the Assyrians. 
were to take people away from their land and settle them in other lands, that way they could curb rebellion. Because how are you going to sit up there and do a rebellion if you're not even familiar with the territory? You, you can't sit up there and stage no coup. You're not familiar with the territory. You don't understand the terrain. You don't understand what's going on. So how are you going to be successful? That's why they did that. And it worked. Many nations did that. Oh, I'm sorry. You guys never heard of the United States or Russia? Yeah, United States and Russia practices that same thing where they take people away from their own land once they conquer their land and they settle them in other lands. You don't believe me, just pay attention to the United States history. Okay? When they took care of Hawaii, ladies and gentlemen, when they took care of Alaska, when they took care of every single country, every single state in America, did they not remove the Indians and resettle them in other places that they were not as familiar with? It's a tradition in war. That way they could curb rebellion, they could, recur they could curb uprising. That's why Geronimo was such a problem for them. Because that fool didn't matter where he was, he was staging revolt after revolt after revolt. He was making them look stupid. So what did they do to Geronimo? Well, they couldn't kill him because if you kill him, you make him a martyr. So what they do is they diminished him in the eyes of everyone and allowed him to die diminished so that he wasn't the hero that he really was. But hold on now. The kingdom of Judah was one of the region's two major Hebrew kingdoms, and it centered on the powerful city of Jerusalem. It had once been part of a united kingdom of Israel, but in the face of Assyrian aggression, the kingdom had been broken up. It was now divided into the kingdom of Israel in the north, ruled by a puppet king, and Judah in the south. The Judean king at the time was a man named Hezekiah. He was an energetic ruler and seems to have been driven by religious fervor. The religion of the ancient Israelites was something of an oddity in this region at the time because it disallowed the worship of any god but the Hebrew god Yahweh.
As we've seen, worship in places like Assyria was a much more eclectic affair. You might make offerings to Marduk while you were visiting Babylon on business, and make an offering to Ashur when you got home. You might make an offering to Ea if your son was going on a long voyage by boat, or to Gula if someone you knew was sick. In the Assyrian worldview, the gods of other cities were often seen as hostile, and were thought to be subordinate to the great god Ashur, but they were still thought to very much exist. In fact, the Assyrians had a habit of kidnapping the gods of their conquered enemies. Sometimes when they captured a new city, Okay, that's the bad part. I'm gonna have to do this video all over again. And because I had the microphone off. I've been turning the microphone off so you guys won't hear bad back noise, background noise. You know what? I'm gonna just go ahead and let that play. Basically, I was just saying that, and if you did hear it, I don't know. If it was no sound, I apologize. Okay? Forgot to turn the microphone back on. It's a button that I forgot to push. All I was saying is that they want to blame it on the fear of Assyria as to why the two tribe nations split. That is not why. It split because Jehovah ordered them to split. Okay? It had nothing to do with the true tribe nation. Um, I mean, uh, Assyria. It had everything to do with Jehovah saying, oh no, that's not the way it's going to be around here. That was the issue. Ladies and gentlemen, I am sitting up here working with two different systems, two different uh, solar systems. And right now, the, the refrigerator for the RV, this thing is an energy hog. I mean, literally, this thing is an energy hog. It sucks up all the energy. And it ain't shy. I promise you, it ain't shy. It knows what it's doing, and it dares you to say something about it. So what I am doing, I'm also getting ready to mop. But because that refrigerator sucks up so much energy, leaving it on for half the day eats up most of the uh, energy coming in through half the system. The system can handle all of it. I can leave it on the whole day if all of the solar panels were hooked up together. However, what most people don't know, when you have solar panels, you must use what's, well, you definitely must use, if you want to conserve energy and get the best out of the system, you must use an MPPT. Now, an MPPT is a charge controller, and it regulates the energy because you're converting energy from solar to DC current, direct current. And because you're transferring and um, sitting up there condensing that energy so that you have that current, what happens, y'all, is you need something that's going to do it in the most efficient way or you'll be wasting electricity. So an MPP, an MPPT, P as in Paul, P as in Paul, T as in Tom, charge controller, M as in Mary, that charge controller gives you efficiency. The ones I have gives me at least 90% efficiency. I've just ordered two more. I'm returning the other two. I ain't got money to be spending like that. But I just ordered two more, returning the other two, because Black Friday, they had them on sale. So now I get to return the other two, get my money back eventually, and have some money in somebody's bank. Uh, before the crisis hits, you know. But getting back to this, I do apologize to you all for turning the mic off. And so that we don't have that problem, I won't turn it off again. What I said, you know, like I said, if it played and if it recorded, I apologize for repeating it. But again, Solomon, king of Israel, he controlled the entire 12 tribe kingdom. 12 tribe because of the half tribe of Manasseh and the half tribe of Ephraim plus the other 11 tribes, because the Levites were not a tribe, with the understanding that they were a part of that numbering 12 tribes. Levites were a tribe that was not, pay attention, protected by the king of Israel. I know it sounds strange, huh? Why would they not protect the Levites? Because they were Jehovah's property. 
he protected his own property. I know, I know. It's hard for you to understand, but that's the way it was. Okay, this has nothing to do with your logic. Everybody wants to put their logic into things. Well, anyway, Solomon didn't remain faithful. Solomon did all kind of stupid things at the end of his life. And so he was rejected. Solomon, you had a good heart at first, but you done turned into a stupid fool. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. <laughs> I'm going to take the kingdom away from your son. I'm still going to leave two parts of the kingdom because of the sake of David, your father, whom I promised. But the ten tribes, I'm going to give it to your enemy. And that's exactly what he did. He gave it to Solomon's enemy, a person that Solomon had been fighting with and having problems with. Solomon caused this young man so much problems that he ran off to Egypt. He was a slave. He was not an Israelite. He was a foreigner. And when he ran off to Egypt, he stayed there until Solomon's death. And then he told the king of Egypt, hey, yo, homie, papa, let me go back to Egypt. Yeah, I know you do everything for me and I got everything I need here and I shouldn't want to go nowhere, but I just needs to go. You don't mind? All right, thanks. Hey, uh, you ain't got to send no troops or anything with me, but let my peoples go with me. Yeah, I'm the junior Moses. Yeah, they let me and my people go. All right, no plagues? There ain't going to be no plagues. All you got to do is do what I ask. Okay, got it. All right, no problem. And he left. He goes to Solomon's son. And he says, yo, Rehoboam. And Rehoboam said, what up? Said, my name is Jeroboam. Man, I know who the, you are. You the one who's causing my pops all them problems. Hey, 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 hey. Let, let's keep that out of this, okay? Your pops, hey, don't be, don't be talking about your pops like that. Your pops gone, bruh. Show some respect. All right, what the, you want? Uh, yo, Ray, uh, you know, we, my people and I, we've been serving y'all, you and your pops. And we're willing to still serve you and do whatever you say. It's just, you know, could you lighten the burden that's on us a little bit? And if you do lighten the burden, hey, we will serve you for eternity without ever complaining. <sighs> Red Boom told Jeroboam, he says, hey, yo, you know what? Tell you what, you, 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 you surprised me. I didn't expect you to come at me like this. I thought you were going to come at me with attitude. But since you guys have made such an offer. Can you give me three days to think about it? And then come back to this very same spot and meet me in three days and I'll let you know what my answer is. So Red Bomb, everybody agreed. They walk away. Red Bomb go to the older men. He said, hey, hey, older men, you guys were around my pops. Yeah, you picked up some of that wisdom from him. Hey, can you tell me what, what I should do? You know, they saying they're they going to just, they're going to do what we ask and everything. And, I, you know, I kind of believe them. What, what y'all think? And the older men said, you know what? them with some honest people okay if they give you their word they're gonna keep their word so i think you should lighten the burden on them it ain't gonna hurt you none lightening the burden on them it's gonna show that you're a merciful king it's gonna show your wisdom you'll be standing next to your pops and red bone said hey you know what older man thank you i appreciate that now can y'all take y'all old decrepit anuses on out there uh, so i can talk to my peoples nah -uh, don't help them all right, then no, don't push them or nothing. Don't wheelchair them or nothing. Let them walk. So now that the old men are gone, complaining and yelling and screaming and cursing them out underneath their breath, you know, uh, he talks to his friends, you know, the friends who've been leeching off of him. They're his friends only because his pop was king and they had money. And these are the friends that he goes to for advice, the ones who ain't got no responsibility because everything they got he gave to them. So, of course, they're going to tell him what he want to hear. And so the friends told him, hey, man, don't you dare take no burden off them people. These are individuals who ain't never suffered no burden. So, uh-uh, you tell them when they come back, you say, my father's pinky. Or, no, he said, my father's thigh will feel like my pinky when I get finished with you ignorant mother." No, I ain't taking no burden off of you. I'm going to increase it. And so when he goes and speaks to them, that's what he tells them. He takes the advice of the stupid men as opposed to the wise men. And Jeroboam comes back. Jeroboam says, hey, Jeroboam. No, nah, man, I ain't accepting your offer. No, nah, I, don't, I don't give a 
No, nah, y'all, y'all going to work. And when, when y'all work, we're going to increase y'all work. No, we're going to make life so miserable on y'all that y'all going to wish y'all was back in Egypt. And Rehoboam, I mean, Jeroboam told Rehoboam, say, yo, Ray, hold on a second. Hey, y'all, this fool's crazy. This mother out of his mind. Everybody back to your homes. We ain't got no part with Jeroboam. Uh, I mean, excuse me. We ain't got no part with Rehoboam. We're going to go back to our homes. We ain't serving this mother. Ladies and gentlemen, they left. Rehoboam got the military together, and he was going to go chase after them. And before he could get out of the city, Jehovah stopped him. Said, uh-uh, take your butt and go back home. Uh-uh, I'm not sanctioning this. What is happening is because I am allowing it. This is what I promised to the prophet that I was going to do because your father did not strictly obey me. I did promise that I would leave in this city a remnant, two tribes. So you will stay here and you will rule over the two tribes for the sake of my servant David, whom I swore through in a covenant to always have someone seated upon his throne. And if you obey me and listen to me, man, I will make you successful. I will make you into your own dynasty. You think he listened? <laughs> if he didn't listen to the older man, what makes you think he's going to listen to Jehovah? Of course not. But that's why the ten tribe nation and the two tribe nation of Israel split. It isn't because they were afraid of the Assyrians. That's what this idiot is saying in this uh, documentary here. Why? Because he's guessing as opposed to what they wrote. He just mentioned that Israel documented both sides of the story and how unusual that was. Well, throughout the entire Bible's canonicity, canonicity, throughout the entire Bible's canonicity, ladies and gentlemen, that's the good and the ugly is told by every single person. Now, I want y'all to pay attention to this right here. They sometimes when they captured a new city, they would take the statue of its gods to its temple. They couldn't do that with Jerusalem because Jerusalem didn't have statues of gods. Now, hold on, of Jehovah God. They did have false religious statues. They did have statues of false gods. They even put them in the temple, which is why Jehovah allowed these nations to come against them. Because he told them, you ever have any other God against my face? And I will turn my back on you. So that's what he did. Okay? Peace out, G. All right. H Town! Hold on. Oh, sorry. I got to do it the right way. Touch screen. Come on now, play. They would take the statues of its gods back to the Assyrian capital as a way of harnessing their power for themselves. But the religion of the Hebrews was different. It held that there was only one God. If you worshipped any other deity, it was believed that you were at best talking to the air, and at worst, communing with evil spirits. And King Hezekiah was one of the most strident religious rulers of ancient Judah. He enacted sweeping religious reforms, including strict instructions to worship only the Jewish God, Yahweh. To only worship Jehovah, no other gods. And because they had those false gods, those false statues, those, those so-called idols in Jehovah's temple, he removed them. And Sennacherib tried to use that against Hezekiah. Way. Shame on them. He removed all other statues and icons from the temple of Jerusalem. As the Book of Kings, chapter 218 in the Hebrew Bible recalls, Vayhi b'shnat shalosh lehoshea ben Ela melech Yisrael, malachis tia ben Achaz. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, son of Ela, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. And he did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. He removed the high places and broke the pillars, and he broke in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did offer to it. 
Mikhail Trimlo. Vai. Ladies and gentlemen, for almost a thousand years, the Israelites worshipped that serpent, that copper serpent that Moses made and had Aaron put on a signal pole. They've been worshipping it. Interesting, ain't it? And so Hezekiah grounded that junk in the dust. Said, uh uh, I'm tired of that. Y'all, this is the reason why we in all these problems and all these troubles, because y'all ain't doing what y'all supposed to do. That was the Israelites, y'all. Now, don't want to take this on. I just want to say that well we'll 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 skip to it so that you guys will see. Hold on now. That ain't supposed to happen. Okay, they're talking about Sennacherib and all of his troops. 180,000 men. He brings the entire military, his entire army. I want you all to listen to the excuse as to why Sennacherib and his army did not succeed in capturing Jerusalem. The force would have come into view like a shadow on the land. In the center of their formations, the main body of infantry would have massed organized into tight, compact units, their spear points glittering in the sun. Even more terrifying would be the trundling wheels of enormous siege engines come to tear down the walls of the city. The Judean military was insignificant in comparison. They were made up of militias and mercenaries huddled behind the walls of Lachish that must have suddenly seemed like a pitiful defense. Oh no, don't y'all dare sit up here and throw no stupid commercial. You can I easily got... train yourself to listen uh -uh. faster. Hold on. If you were able to listen Hold on, fast, you can consume more information. I got, I know my ad blocker works. Lord have mercy. Sorry, and it didn't do that on the other device. What Hold on. What happened next is depicted on a remarkable series of carvings, etched in meticulous detail in gypsum, designed to decorate the walls of Sennacherib's southwest palace in Nineveh. In their day, these carvings would have been colored. Ladies and gentlemen, at this point, he's telling the truth. Sennacherib and his men did besiege Jerusalem, but they never entered Jerusalem because the prophecy Their details was picked out with dye. The prophecy was that Sennacherib would not even step foot into Jerusalem, and they did not step foot into Jerusalem. There is nothing written in any history that they entered into Jerusalem at that time or subsequent to that time. Assyria never conquered Jerusalem. They did conquer Samaria. They did conquer Lachesh, but they did not conquer Judah. Hold on now. ...of green, blue, red, and yellow. The Lachish relief is an incredible piece of art, although the events it depicts are horrific. It's a perfect snapshot of a moment in history that would otherwise be completely lost. Capturing the clothes and the faces of the soldiers and the frenzied action of the battle. The Assyrians first built a camp and began to settle in for a long siege of the city. And it's here that their expertise at engineering came into play. As the weeks dragged by, they slowly built a ramp of stone and earth leading up to the city's walls. It would have been a round-the-clock effort. Assyrian workers toiled to form the mud bricks that made up the ramp, baking them in the sun, while soldiers shielded the workers as they built it, the occasional arrow or sling stone whistling down from the defenders on the walls. The desperation now, this is the only problem. Like with the Babylonians who came shortly thereafter, uh, roughly less than 40 years after this, Babylon came into the land um, right after the reign of Josiah, the king of Israel, uh, which was uh, one of the 
think of Josiah was the grandson of um, Hezekiah. Just as it was prophesied in scripture that Josiah would be the one to do all the things that he did. Josiah, during the time of Babylon, the Babylonians raised a siege rampart with wood and stones. Remember, Jerusalem is on a mountain. It's on the side of a hill. Jerusalem is built on a mountain. It was not built on flat land. Don't, his story is trying to make it believe that this was flat land. No. So they didn't need to build anything of no dirt getting into Jerusalem. They built it of wood from the trees that were around Jerusalem. You'll see the story says that they tore down those trees and they built up a siege rampart. They were going to capture that city. There was nothing that was going to stop them. He had 185,000 men. Judah did not have 185,000 anybody. At the most, they would have had maybe 80,000, 50,000 people in the city at that time. But they definitely did not have 185,000. And in their military, probably 10 to 20,000. Haven't read the story in a long time, but they do give you the numbers. So when they built the siege rampart, it was out of wood. It was not out of dirt, clay. One of the city's defenders can be clearly seen in the archaeological record at the site of Lachish. At some point, we can see that they ran out of iron and in desperation began to carve new arrowheads out of bone. Ladies and gentlemen, when Jerusalem was destroyed, there is no way in the world they would have been able to find the weaponry. Jerusalem was destroyed in uh, 607 BCE. Okay, Jerusalem was destroyed in 607 BC, usually referred to as BCE, before our common era. And when it was destroyed, that was 600 years before Jesus came on the scene, which was over 2,600 years ago. Jerusalem was rebuilt, people. In 537 BCE, from 537 BCE, and the numbers went backwards, downward, uh, to 514 BCE, Jerusalem was rebuilt. It was rebuilt in the Roman times, so it is impossible for them to attribute the weapons that they found as being discovered from that period. No, what they would have discovered is that when the Babylonians came, and captured the city and burned it to the ground and completely destroyed it, then yes, they would have been finding those type of weaponry. Because the people were attempting to fight the Babylonians to no avail. But let's continue, shall we? Bone. Finally, when the ramp was completed, the vast Assyrian siege engines would have rumbled into life. These siege engines were something like an Iron Age tank. They were made up of a large wooden frame, like a mobile fortress, on enormous wheels. They had a tower on top, from which archers could rain fire on the defenders. At the front of the engine was a large heavy instrument, somewhere between a battering ram, a spear and a hammer. This was used to break the mud brick walls of enemy cities, jimmying between the gaps in the bricks and stones, and slowly wearing them down. Defenders would constantly try to set these engines on fire, and so they were covered in thick layers of wet animal hides. A constant stream of Assyrian workers would hurry up to the front lines carrying jars and skins of water, dousing the engine and putting out the fires. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what Assyria would have done. But in this case, Assyria never lit a single fire, never had an opportunity. They were getting ready to get ready, but something happened. Let him tell you what happened. As well as these engines, the Assyrians would have laid countless ladders against the walls. The defenders rained down arrows and stones, but the result was inevitable. The defense collapsed. People fled the city in all directions and the Assyrian army finally marched into Lachish. From here on... Now, again, Lachish was one of the cities. 
It was not the main city. It was not the city with the temple. It was not the city of the king. It was one of the cities. Like Los Angeles is a city in California, but it's not the only city in California. Okay, it's not the capital. The carvings begin to look like a depiction of hell. As a punishment for resisting, the city of Lakish was utterly destroyed. The inhabitants of the city were rounded up and deported to faraway lands on the other side of the River Tigris. The carvings show them leaving the Hold city on. in long columns. Did the workers as they built it? Remember, he talked about arrow or the individuals would have been from the defenders carted off. Walls. Let's find it out. Set these engines on fire, and the Assyrian army finally marched into Lakish. From here on, the carvings begin to look like a depiction of hell. As a punishment for resisting. Ladies and gentlemen, they did not hang people on crosses. They hung people on stakes. This was the tradition. When you burnt a witch, you burnt a witch at a stake. When the Indians burned people at the stake, they burned people at the stake, not at the cross. Burning people at crosses, hanging people on crosses, didn't happen until the 4th century CE. Almost a thousand years no, over a thousand years. Ladies and gentlemen, this was 607 BCE. Fourth century is the fourth century. <laughs> okay. Hold on. Let, let me let him finish explaining. The city of Lakish was utterly destroyed. The inhabitants of the city were rounded up and deported to faraway lands. Okay, that was their tradition, to deport them to faraway lands, which is why Samaritans and the Jews did not get along. Because they were not Jews. That's why Samaria and Jews did not get along, because they were people of the nations, even though some of them were Jews. Because some of the Jews were left remain, the poorest people were left remain in the city. But the other people who weren't the poorest ones were brought to the city. Okay, however, pay attention. Pay attention. What they're about to tell you is backwards. Hold on. On the other side of the River Tigris, the carvings show them leaving the city in long columns. Men and women riding bullock carts piled high with all their possessions. Children sitting on the carts or cradled in their mother's arms. The carvings even show some prisoners being forced to play musical instruments as they march away from their home. Okay, An we're gonna go here. Perhaps also recorded in the ancient lament of Psalm 130. Hath any of the gods of the nations ever delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and of Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharhaim, of Hena and Ipha? Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? It looked as though all was lost, but it's at this point that luck began to turn in Hezekiah's favor. The Hebrew Bible recalls him praying to his god Yahweh to deliver him from the Assyrian siege, and the Hebrew poet historian who wrote the Book of Kings record this reply coming down to him from the heavens. Before we get the reply, Hold on. Hold on. Before we get the reply, let me show you something. Ladies and gentlemen, Hezekiah is a king. That's not the attire of a king. Hezekiah was a king. That is not the attire of a king on any gay day of the week. Oh, look at that. I said gay of the week. Anyway, um, hold on. Let me, let me see where they were.
Oh, no, no, no. We can't have that. We we need to find out what the the issue was. So here's what was said. Him from the heavens. Now have I brought it to pass, yea, it is done, that fortified cities should be laid waste into ruinous heaps. Their inhabitants were as the grass of the field, and as the green herb, and as the grass on the housetops, and as corn blasted before it is grown up. Thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, He shall not come unto this city, nor shoot an arrow there, neither shall he come before it with shield, nor cast a mound against it. And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred fourscore and five thousand. And when men arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. Now, y'all hear it? Had a hundred and eighty-five thousand men. One hundred and eighty-five. He took his whole entire military with him. They were going to bring Jerusalem, raise it to the ground. Why? <laughs> you see how they're showing a mosque. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, no mosque was in Jerusalem at the time. That's where the temple was. Don't know why they did that, but the walls around Jerusalem, it was a lot thicker than this wall. This was the rebuilt wall. The original wall was solid as a rock. And the command was that Sennacherib would not shoot an arrow into the city that he would not come into the city. Now, if you listen to this idiot, according to what, wherever he's getting information from, Sennacherib went into Jerusalem and captured Jerusalem. And there was no history of that because Josiah, the king of Israel, was killed by Nacor. Josiah, the king of Israel, was killed by Nacor the king of Egypt. He was the grandson of Hezekiah. The Bible shows Hezekiah's son becoming king. Then Josiah's father being assassinated and Josiah becoming king. Ladies and gentlemen, pay attention. According to him, none of that ever happened. Jerusalem was conquered. But they don't explain it when it was conquered what they did. They don't explain, according to history, Mm, Sennacherib came into the city, which means the God of the Bible lied. The person doing this so-called documentary is not doing it based upon the facts because he cannot promote the truth because the truth goes contrary to his beliefs. So let me explain something to y'all. Very beginning of the video shows Nineveh being a city that nobody knew. The ruins are in the middle of the desert, and nobody knew who built those structures. And you're going to go back and listen to the beginning of the video. They're wondering who built those structures. Nobody knew because that was the prophecy. That was the prophecy that she would be uninhabited. The Assyrians were going to be destroyed. That's what the whole book of Jonah is about, ladies and gentlemen. He pardoned their error. But they went back to doing the same stupid thing, the bloodthirstiness. They went back to that same violence. Same as this planet that we're living in right now. All of the violence. School shootings and all this stupid stuff. He don't like it. So, Nineveh ceased being a nation. Why? Because he allowed the Babylonians. He gave Nineveh as a spoil for the Babylonians. You know one thing the Babylonians didn't care for? We know that the Babylonians did commerce. You know what they did not care for? Gold or silver. They counted it as nothing. Go and do your research and find out what Babylon counted as valuable. But they definitely didn't count gold or silver as valuable. So when they went into a, a country or anything, they could not be bribed. But Babylon is who destroyed Nineveh. 
And Sennacherib was not king when he did that. The reason why Babylon could destroy Nineveh so quickly is because they lost 185,000 men at one time, the whole army, just like Egypt. When Pharaoh and the 600,000 men with him were destroyed, Egypt couldn't defend itself against any enemy. Anybody who rose against Egypt at that time, Egypt had no power. Anybody who rose against Assyria, Assyria had no power. Go and do the real research. Don't do this little cheap junk by listening to this moron. Go and do the real research. Hold on, one more again. We may never know the truth of what happened to bring... Do you see what he said? We may never know the truth. So what he's about to tell you is completely speculation. It says we may never know the truth about what happened to bring an end to the siege. Really? Are you telling me that they just upped and walked away? They, he brought 185,000 men to this city. Are you telling me he just upped and went away? Now he's going to blame it. Perhaps it was a plague. Ladies and gentlemen, if it was a plague, how come the Israelites? How come they did not suffer from the same plague? They're in the same vicinity. They're on the wall. Oh, by the way, go back, pay attention. This is not the wall. <laughs> this is not the wall. The people were on top of the wall. The wall was walking spaces. People could walk on top of the wall. This ain't the wall. This ain't, ain't nobody walking on that without falling. Okay, hold on. Bring an end to the siege of Jerusalem. The most likely explanation is, is that Jehovah did it because he's the one who made the promise. But this idiot wants to claim that it was something other than the true God, Jehovah. There is no other explanation because why? It goes against what they believe because Jehovah can't possibly exist. He can't possibly give his word that Sennacherib would not enter into that city. He just said there is no explanation as to why the siege ended because they never entered into the city. They never fought against Jerusalem. Not even a single arrow. Exactly what Jehovah said was not going to be allowed. Hold on. It's probably an outbreak of plague among the army of Assyria. Again, why didn't it affect the Israelites? You guys remember the bubonic plague, black plague? You even see this virus now. This virus is going cross borders. Well, they were just on the other side of the wall, a whole entire city, and none of them suffered from a plague. There's no documented history of anybody in Jerusalem suffering from a plague. But the Bible does say, and you heard them quote it, that he sent this angel and he killed 185,000 men. Hold on. Plague was a constant threat to any campaigning army and it wouldn't have been the first campaign to end in this way. Well, then why didn't it end like that before? Now, because Sennacherib was taunting Jehovah, that's right, see, he ain't, he, he ain't read the part about where Sennacherib is calling Jehovah uh, uh, basically an infant with no power, saying that he was stronger than Jehovah. Same as Pharaoh, remember, who is Jehovah, that I should obey his voice? <laughs> <laughs> Who is Jehovah? So Sennacherib said the same thing. Sennacherib returns to Assyria. They leave. Why? Because all of his military is dead. He goes and he prays before his God, the God that he serves. I, I don't know if I forgot the name of their God. Don't really care. And he's in that temple. And while he's in, I think it's Dagon, but I'm not sure. I believe it is Dagon. But while he's in the temple of his God, his two sons come in and they kill him. And then they escape. Why? For fear that they too would be killed. And his son becomes king, his other son becomes king in his stead. But you do not hear anything else about Assyria being a mighty nation after that. Go back, take a look. You do not hear anything about Assyria being a mighty kingdom after that. Probably this probably happened right about, I don't remember the year, but I know it's about 650, 665, something like that. Because you got to give Josiah some time to reign for 32 years. And his father to reign, I think his father reigned maybe two to nine years. I, look, I haven't read it in a while, so you can go take a look and 
check it out. Because ain't nobody else going to give the his, history of Israel but the Israelites. Just like nobody else gave the history of Assyria but the Assyrians and the Bible. Let's continue, just for a little bit. One Egyptian account, repeated by the later historian Herodotus, recounts how the Assyrian army was turned back after an infestation of field mice. Hold on. The army was turned back? Because there was an infestation of field mice? Because it's an Egyptian account? Egypt? Egypt? Ladies and gentlemen, hold on. Egypt was nowhere near that. There is no documentation and no infestation of field mice. Go and look in Jerusalem if there was an infestation of field mice. Because the people lived outside the city. Go back and look at how Jerusalem was set up. Not everybody lived in Jerusalem. They lived outside the gates of Jerusalem. Go back and look that if there was an infestation of mice, then they would have been infesting Jerusalem as well. There is no such thing. But there is some Egypt, Egyptian person that said, Egypt? Because somebody in Egypt wrote something? Man, I, I heard that somebody wrote the book called the Book of Enoch. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let me explain something. Even if Enoch had wrote a book, even if he had wrote a book, Enoch lived before the flood. Enoch lived before the flood. I don't remember Noah being told, hey, gather two books and bring them on the ark with you. Yeah, go get that book of Enoch. Yeah, bring that on the ark. I don't know what it's written out of. You just go get it, okay? Yeah, we're going to preserve that mother alive. Yeah, I, I'm not going to make it part of the Bible. Uh-uh, we're just going to preserve it and just going to let people find it in the last days. That's where that true knowledge will become abundant stuff. That's what we're going to do. Lord, have mercy, people. I, I really don't get people. Ladies and gentlemen, do your own research. Don't go off with junk like this. Do you understand they do the same thing with the law? Do you know how many people are going to read this and think that this is actual history? Now, I'm only showing you this because I had a conversation with somebody tell, trying to tell me what history was. Ladies and gentlemen, I go to the foundation. So I went to the encyclopedias. I read the history of all of this. Babylon, all of that stuff. They want to make you think that the history of Babylon with Nebuchadnezzar and everything started completely different than what it started. Nebuchadnezzar's father died. That's how he became king, roughly about the age of 19. Okay, the same thing with Alexander the Great. He was about 17 years old when his father died. Okay? And he was considered the great after 12 years of being in power. The great, and then he died. So hold on. Swarmed their camp. The mice are said to have gnawed away at the Assyrian bowstrings and shield handles, making them unable to fight. The mice ate away at their bowstrings. Ladies and gentlemen, do you know how long it would take them to eat away at their bowstrings, especially if they're holding them? Hold on now. They had more than bowstrings. They had spears. But the mice ate away at the bowstrings. Man, if, if the mice ate away at 5 or 10, there's 185,000 men. So if they ate away at 5 or 10 or 20, maybe even 100 bowstrings, do you think we're keeping it on the ground? Do you think that that 185,000 group of men is not destroying those mice? It's 185,000 men. How many of them do you think it would take to destroy those mice while they're going over the gate? According to him, they had already built the siege rampart. According to the Bible, they had already built the siege rampart. So I, that's how Lakesh was built, people. That's how Lakesh was built. Because someone decided to lay siege on Jerusalem. And they took that wood after they defeated that idiot and they built up Lakesh. So, again, we're to believe that these trillions of mice. No, okay, let's, let's be reasonable. These million of mice. Millions. Because there would have had to have been millions to turn that army back. See, we went from plague to now mice. And, and now they're eating at bowstrings. 
Now, if this was an actual believable story right here, he wouldn't have told us about a plague. Remember, he started this out by telling about a plague. He's trying to give every explanation except for, A, Jehovah said he was going to do this, and it happened the way he said, and there's no other explanation. Hold on. And this is possibly another slightly fanciful description of a plague. Possibly? An army. Possibly? The Assyrian sources are understandably quiet about what must have been... Whoa! The Assyrian sources are quiet? So, and you're going to go to Egypt to get your source of information or speculation? You went to Jerusalem to get information and confirmation earlier, so why didn't you go back to them? He said that they're silent on this. The Assyrians, they boasted about everything. Now, I want you to understand, if you watch the rest of this video, you'll see where he's claiming Sennacherib is bragging about what he did to Jerusalem, about how he captured Jerusalem. That's what he's saying. Sennacherib bragged about how he captured Jerusalem. Really? Hmm. I don't see you saying anybody got captured have been an embarrassing failure. It was an embarrassing failure. Sennacherib returned home, as the scriptures say, embarrassed. Why? He just lost 185,000 men. He was boasting like he himself was a god. How do you lose 185,000 in your whole entire military to where you are left to return home with your head down? Mightiest army on earth at the time. Ladies and gentlemen, Assyria was a force to be reckoned with. Everybody was afraid of Assyria. Not after they lost 185,000 men. Because now Jehovah did it again. Proved that he was more powerful. Hold on. An embarrassing failure. The only source to mention this campaign focuses on the early victories won by the Assyrians and on the tribute that Hezekiah handed over. This campaign gives just one brief snapshot of what the Assyrian war machine was like. And wait, how wait, felt. wait, hold on. Hezekiah paid tribute before, not after. There was no reason to pay tribute. Assyria had been defeated. Jerusalem got that victory. You have 185,000 men laying dead in a field. Jerusalem gets that victory. You don't get to cover that up. What you do is you get to sit up there and remove it from the writings and demand and declare that nobody else can write about it. But just because they didn't write about it, remember he said earlier that the information was preserved in Scripture. And he hasn't contradicted what the Israelites said. Hold on. To be on the receiving end of its fury. What about being on the receiving end of Jehovah's fury? My bad. Still, the campaign had ended in an embarrassment. And it was perhaps this defeat that led the city of Babylon in the south to desire its freedom. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to stop right there because that's exactly, remember he said it was perhaps this defeat that led Babylon to express this desire to do whatever it wanted to do at this point. Okay, history says that Babylon did get its start this way. And that Assyria couldn't do anything to stop Babylon. And this was uh forgot what uh, Nebuchadnezzar's father was, his name was. But Nebuchad Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, pronounced both ways, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, when he took over, he marched as if there was no tomorrow. He went over everything, through everything, and by everything. Ain't nobody stopping Nebuchadnezzar. Now, look, I got to go. I just wanted to show this to you guys because there are a lot of people who don't understand Jehovah's Witnesses. Ladies and gentlemen, we go by what the scriptures say. We go by what actual history is. We don't go by this junk right here. This doesn't tell the real history. This is just some, some person telling you what history is supposed to be, possibly is, or, or, or perhaps is. You see all of the clues that he gives as to Possibly it was a plague, possibly it was rats, and that's probably because plagues are associated with rats. That's why they said rats. What the? Ladies and gentlemen, how stupid that is. 
I mean, it's like reaching and grasping for straws. If you don't know an answer, just say, look here, mother, I don't know why they left. I mean, the Bible says they left because they, he lost all of his men, and that would seem to be right because he went back home. He went back home. Then he says, well, their, their history is silent on what happened after this. You lose 185,000 men, your entire military, you're going to be silent too. What could you say? I'm king of what? A bunch of women because all the men are dead? What you talking about women like that for? Because back then the women didn't fight in wars. So you can't call that an army. Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to let you get away with that one. So, ladies and gentlemen, again, so did all of you know, if you're getting your information from videos, pay attention. If you're getting your information from videos, this idiot doesn't even tell you where to go and get the information. Doesn't tell you where he's getting the information. Yes, 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 yes. He says he quotes from this and quotes from that. But his quoting is selective. He's not telling you all the sources that are out there. He's telling you the selected source that are out there. Why? Because he needs to control the narrative. That's how information works, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, with that being said, I got to go. I am so glad we had this time together. Y'all take care. This is just to show you that as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, I serve the true God. I serve the God of the Bible. He's the explanation for what happened in this situation. And I don't believe in coincidences. Okay? I did not survive because the doctors gave me some miracle drug. The doctor even said that I should be dead. That there's no way in the world I should be alive. The anesthesiologist wouldn't even walk into the room where I was laid in bed. He yelled at me. He yelled in the CCU, critical care unit, yelled at me saying that you are, you are dead, man. You are dead. Blah, blah, blah. We're talking about anger. I saw the anger in his face. He could not explain how I ended up talking, waking up and talking out of a coma from a 125 degree body temperature. I know who to give the credit to. I know who to give the credit to. How many times my life has been spared? How many times my life has been in danger? I know who to give the credit to. Yes, I know to him I'm special. I don't care about being special to anybody else. He's the only one that counts. But when we have idiots sitting up here putting junk out like this and people listening to it and running with that, don't do that, y'all. I only turned it here because it said it's Assyria, and I, I like Assyria. I like the history of Assyria. But they took the truth and mixed it with lies. You can't do that. But that's what they do in these churches. They take the truth and mix it with lies. Okay? I don't lie to you people. I, there's no reason. why. Look, this is my rule. In order for me to lie to you, I have to be afraid of you. And even then, I wouldn't lie to you. Okay? Because it would take a whole lot for you to make me afraid of you. Okay, you would have to have the power of my God, and he would have to allow you to come my way. And he ain't did that for nobody. You know what I'm saying, Vern? All right, so ladies and gentlemen, peace, chicken grease, and fish oil. Gotta go. Y'all take care, okay? Arriva Adirchi.